everyone. Thanks. Um, again, my name is Kayla Hamlin. I'm the coordinator of conservation and educational outreach at the Canadian Sea Turtle Network. I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about one of our main outreach programs right now, which is our Canadian Sea Turtle Center. So first I'll introduce you to the work of our organization in general. The Canadian Sea Turtle Network is a Halifax-based registered charity that works to both study and protect endangered sea turtle species in Canadian waters and beyond. So we primarily work with the leatherback sea turtle, which is the most common turtle species in Canada's coastal waters, but we also are beginning research on some of the loggerhead sea turtles that are found in our offshore waters, and we occasionally respond to a stranded juvenile green turtle or kisserly turtle that will wash up in the Bay of Fundy. But the focus of our center and my talk today will be on our work with the leatherback. So historically, it wasn't really accepted that sea turtles would come up this far north. Every once in a while, a turtle would wash up dead or a fisherman would find one tangled in their gear, but for the most part, these were just believed to be animals that wandered up here by accident. It wasn't until the late 1990s when our current science advisor, Mike James, began a citizen science style research project for his graduate studies to try to document the presence of leatherbacks here in the Maritimes. So Mike and our current executive director, Kathleen Martin, went all around Nova Scotia starting in 1998, visiting fishing wharves, talking to fishermen about their turtle sightings, and putting up these posters, have you seen this turtle, with a toll-free number that fishermen could call to report any turtles that they saw send us their photos, tell us the coordinates of where they found the turtle. So up until this point in the history of Atlantic Canada, only about 70 confirmed leatherback sightings had ever been reported. Within that first summer of putting up the posters, a couple hundred sightings came in, and to this day we've received thousands of confirmed sea turtle sightings in the Maritimes. And so this really proved to the skeptical sea turtle science community that the leatherback is here in significant numbers and we're an important part of their habitat. And so it was out of this partnership between scientists and commercial fishermen that the Sea Turtle Network was born. And they are the real experts at working at sea, as we've heard. Um, and so it was in continued partnership with them that we were able to launch the world's first in-water research program, going out to sea to study leatherbacks in their oceanic environment, in contrast to the usual sea turtle research which would happen on their southern nesting beaches. So the fishermen also remain our most important conservation partner because the number one threat to adult leatherback turtles is accidental entanglement in fishing gear. And so because fishermen are on the front lines of this issue, they'll be the ones to discover the turtles in their gear. They really need to be the ones um, that are part of the solution as well. So over the last couple of decades of our research and many uh, dozens of tracking studies, we've been able to identify that our leatherbacks come up to our waters from regions through South America, Central America, um, and Florida to forage on the plentiful jellyfish that are in our waters each summer. So turtles from all these different countries aggregate in Canadian waters during the summer to forage and then depart for their respective nesting beaches later in the year. So this puts Canada in a really important conservation position because if something happens to the turtles when they're nesting down in Trinidad, that affects the turtles in Trinidad. But if something happens to the turtles when they're in Canadian waters, that affects turtles from across the Atlantic Basin. So as a result, the leatherback is classified as an endangered species under Canada's Species at Risk Act. However, despite all of this, most Canadians, and indeed even most Maritimers, have no idea that we have sea turtles that come to our waters. This is mostly because the sea turtles are always out at sea, because they don't nest here, they never come onto the beach, and so unless you're going out to sea to fish or to sail or something like that, you'll simply never see one. And so we've done numerous programs to try to combat this. We have done educational programs based in schools, and we visit a lot of community events. But in the last couple of years, we really wanted to establish an educational outlet that would allow us to have a bricks and mortar place where we could reach both local Nova Scotians, as well as visitors from across the country and even around the world. So this outlet is our Canadian Sea Turtle Center. So we first launched the center in 2013 out of Penny's Cove, a small community outside of Halifax. We were there for two summers until last year when we got the opportunity to <coughs> open a kiosk at the Halifax waterfront. Um, so after a lot of work painting and assembling furniture and putting together our, our exhibits, we were able to launch the Sea Turtle Center as it exists today. And we just opened for the 2016 season, so if you want to drop by while you're in town, we'd love to to see you. So we had to consider a few things when we were putting together our Sea Turtle Center. So we've talked a lot about during the 
for this conference about the fact that in environmental education, it's really important for you to create a, an experience where people are going to have an emotional connection with a particular animal or a particular ecosystem that you want them to care about. However, we're talking about an animal that they most likely don't know exists. If they know it exists, they, may, they probably think about it as a faraway tropical thing, um, and they're probably never going to see one for themselves in real life. We're also dealing with a space that's less than 200 square feet. <laughs> we have a few challenges, so I'll give you a sneak peek at what we ended up putting together. So we do have some storyboards that convey information. We have some images um, on the storyboards. We have specimens that are on display. We have some technology, an iPad and a TV screen that's not visible in the photos. We have some outdoor space that we're able to use for interactive activities. And we also have a small retail space that acts as a fundraiser for our charity, although obviously today I'll focus on the educational stuff. So the first thing we wanted to do in our sea turtle center is allow people to see leather back sea turtles in as many ways as possible without physically having a real turtle there, which is simply not possible due to size um, and the fact that they can't survive in captivity. So the first way we do this is simply with the image. So this is an example of a photo that's on one of the storyboards in the Sea Turtle Center. You can see it shows um, the magnificent leatherback turtle's body. It's swimming underwater. It's currently eating a jellyfish. You can see it's streaming out of its nose down its back. Um, so these are really great for just grabbing people's attention and allowing them to see what the turtles look like up close. However, we also want to bring these photos to life. So on our video screen, we also include uh, clips such as this one, that show what leatherback turtles look like when they're out acting in the wild. So people are able to see the graceful way that they move underwater, the powerful way they propel themselves with their flippers, and get a sense of what it would look like to see a sea turtle in the ocean. We also have numerous sea turtle specimens for real leatherback turtles. So um, this is a great way for people to see how leatherbacks are put together, both inside and out. And it is also a great way to demonstrate one of the most interesting things about leatherback turtles, which is their size. An average leatherback in Nova Scotia has a shell length of about a meter and a half, and a turtle of that size weighs 400 kilograms. So we're talking about a six foot thousand pound turtle. So when people are able to reach up their arm and see that it's way smaller than a turtle's flipper, or look down and compare their face to this massive turtle skull, it really gives them a sense of how incredible these animals are. And we also incorporate the size and shape of leatherbacks into various aspects of the kiosk's design itself. So we have numerous sea turtle outlines, many of which are life-size that people can take a look at. And in the Peggy's Cove version of our sea turtle center, we also had a growth chart that asked, are you as tall as a turtle? And we had different measurements of the different carapace lengths of different species, and people could measure themselves to compare. And most people were not as tall as a leatherback turtle. <laughs> And although it's not specific to the turtles themselves, we also try to keep things um, hands-on and minds-on for our youngest learners. So we do have a jellyfish craft station where people are able to, uh, kids are able to take a cardboard jellyfish bell and add some tentacles so they get to see the structure of the uh, jellyfish medusa and, and how a, a turtle may want to eat that. Um, and you can see they take a bit of artistic license, adding faces and so on, but the general concept is there. <laughs> But we don't just want to raise awareness about particular marine species. We want to tell this story about how scientists and fishermen are working together as perhaps unlikely allies to study these amazing animals. So we really want to give people a very concrete idea of what we mean when we say we're doing science research. So again, the first way we can do this is simply with photos. So here's an example of a picture of a field boat that we work on off of Cape Breton Island. You can see it's just a commercial lobster boat that's been outfitted to uh, work with the turtles. And you can see the giant net that we use to capture the sea turtles but for when we do our sampling and our tagging. Again, we can bring those images to life with video clips. This is our science advisor, Mike James. He's, this is an example of a clip we would show. He's going to deploy a camera on the back of the sea turtle. So we're seeing some of his camera footage. The camera goes on the back of the turtle, and then we're underwater, seeing things from the turtle's perspective, looking out over the back of the turtle's head. So this is the technique we use to study how and where and when leatherbacks capture their prey. And this is a very, a very popular type of footage with the public because you're able to see leatherbacks uh, eat jellyfish firsthand from the turtle's perspective. So you can see, um, any second now we'll have a, a large lion's mane jellyfish coming into view. Mm -hmm. How deep was it supposed to see? Um, usually in Canadian waters, they're staying in the upper next layer, so probably above 30 meters or so. It's so a mutual soundtrack then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a little slower than that.
So a very popular public. We also have some examples of equipment that we use when we're doing our research. So this is an example of a satellite tag that we would use for some of our turtle tracking. Um, so this is an actual satellite tag that was deployed on a turtle in Nova Scotia, and it was actually recovered for us by a colleagues down in Columbia who intercepted the turtle when it migrated down there to nest. So we have some uh, photo of those, that, uh, those colleagues with that exact satellite tag in their hands moments after they took it off of the turtle. So being able to connect uh, this equipment with these nice anecdotes is another great educational piece. And people are usually really interested in the turtle tagging in general. Um, so we always have an up-to-date map showing any turtles that we're live tracking at the moment. So this is an example of a turtle that's live right now. The turtle's name is Shanice. She was tagged by our colleagues down in Trinidad. And although you can see she's sticking around the nesting beaches right now, she does have a known history of foraging in Canadian waters. We've seen her here before. Um, so we're really excited to watch her progress moving north. And we also post these up-to-date maps on our blog. So people who see this at the Sea Turtle Center and are interested in following along can then do so by social media. But we ultimately want to bring them out to sea with us as much as possible without physically bringing them onto the field boat, which again would not be possible. Um, so we have solved this issue by FaceTiming in from the field boat to the Sea Turtle Center's iPad uh, while we're out in the field. So this is an example of myself and my colleague Emily calling in from the field boat. And although we can't call in when we're actively working with the turtle, uh, we are able to give them an update on what we've been doing that day. We're able to um, you know, answer any questions they may have and hold the phone up and show them what it looks like to be out at sea. So this is another way that we've been able to connect them directly to the sea turtle scientists in real time. But ultimately, we don't want the leatherback to seem like this far away thing. We don't want it to seem like they're far away, offshore. We want to connect it back to what they're experiencing in the moment. And so we do this by taking advantage of our location right on the Halifax boardwalk. So you can see our kiosk on the right hand side, we have direct access to the water from our kiosk. So we're able to bring visitors right down to the water's edge to take a look at marine animals for themselves. And one of those animals that we're able to show them is jellyfish, although we can't show them a real live turtle, we can show them real live turtle food during the summer months when they're in season. And so we're also going to be starting this year a little bit of a citizen science project where we're going to be monitoring, counting, and identifying jellies with our visitors and hopefully getting some measurements and we're hoping to contribute this data to a graduate student project at Dalhousie right now. Another citizen science style project that we do is harbor cleanups. So each day uh, we go out at high tide with a little uh, dip net that you use to clean a pool and we collect garbage in the little coal fire kiosk. We keep track of what kinds and how many uh, we find and we share the message about what we're doing with our visitors so they get the idea that we want to keep trash out of the ocean and see firsthand what that looks like. As you probably know, sea turtles are one of the animals that commonly consume ocean plastics. So this connects what we're talking about at the center to a local issue they can see for themselves and to this larger marine conservation picture. So basically, at our sea turtle center, we want to change how people see the ocean and change how they think about Canadian wildlife. Next thing they think about a Canadian threatened species Maybe instead of thinking you know, of a terrestrial animal, they'll think of an aquatic animal, maybe the leatherback turtle. So we make these connections with people um, using powerful visuals, including photos and videos. We make it interactive and use hands-on components to our exhibit. And we also try to connect what we're, learn what we're teaching them with their local environment, as well as these larger issues. Um, so you'll probably notice that we take a lot of time to capture really high quality video and photos while we're doing our work. And we do this on purpose. We really spend a lot of time when we're on the boat thinking about how to capture and how to share what we're doing. Um, so I would encourage other researchers and conservation workers to consider potential for science communication and public education when you're documenting what you're doing. So to conclude, I'd like to thank the following financial sponsors of the Sea Turtle Center for their generous support and thank